welcome back. You promised to enjoy it. Video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toast of 60. He is Steve, Xbox Live Steveovich. And it's colder than a witch's titty today. What day is it? In fact, it's February 13th, two days after Steve's birthday, 2021. Happy birthday officially to you, good sir. Thank you, Russ. You know, I, I, I get confused sometimes because I don't know what's colder, which is titty or which is booty. It's, you know, it, it is interesting how that whole saying got started. I, I have no idea what the origins are. Because the, the titty is close to the heart. The so you would think it'd be warmer. It's true, but but it does stick out. Chicken's done, Steve. Hmm. You know, it, it is a, a, an appendage of sorts that is uh, farthest from the heart. That's just true. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> the booty is pretty far from the heart, Russ. I do wonder, though, exactly uh, what, 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 what does a witch's titty look like? Because it's one of those situations where we're conditioned to think about how it tends to be an older... More uh, okay. shrivel. Yeah, pruny. Pruny, yes. As if the plum has turned into a prune. Mm. However, I think that is a narrow-minded view, Steve. I think there are all kinds of different shape sizes and ages. Mm. But then again, I might be thinking it a little too much. You might be. Do you recognize anything on me, Russ? I do. You know what? When you first came in, I did not. But now that you <laughs> drew attention <laughs> to yourself, <laughs> he is wearing a Shinmu t-shirt. I think I gave that to you, didn't I? You gave this to me like 30 years ago. 30 years I don't, ago. I mean, I don't know if it's 30. It might be pretty close to 30. I've had this forever. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's a... And I've never worn it. Never worn it. I've never worn it. You are breaking it in on this show, Steve? Yes. I'm touched. I'm touched. You see, I think you knew without knowing back then <laughs> that at this point in our lives, we would have had COVID, we would have had quarantine, <laughs> and we would have gained weight. We would have had a pandemic. We would have gotten fat. Because when you bought me this shirt... I think I was like in fourth or fifth grade. This is like Dreamcast stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. So this was back in the day, and back then it would have been a nightgown on me. <laughs> and now it pretty much almost fits. It's a little bit big. You know what? I don't think it looks all that big on you. I think it fits you nicely. But you, it, and not every shirt has to be one of those stretchy, muscle-bound t-shirts. That's true. Steve. Yeah, only when I'm swole will I wear one of those. <laughs> But it has it has Shinmu uh, on the. On you, can, the you can just le lean into the table, on Steve. The back. There you go. There you go. Hey, you Representation. Probably, you probably right can't there. see it, but it's signed towards the towards the the. Um, By the way, your phone fell underneath the uh, table. There, oh, Steve. okay. I'll get it. Um, <clears throat> the um, the, the, the you got it signed, and the signature is about like right on my love handle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right, right in the back of the love handle. I was looking for it this morning. I'm I, like, yeah, that's going to be right there. That's going to get stretched. So this is, I'm so glad that, that you wore this. <laughs> this is a great story. I was living in the Bay Area at the time. And I think it was when I was living in Hayward, actually. And uh, a college buddy of mine, somehow, I don't know how he found this out, but uh, Adrian Myshak he somehow found out that Yu Suzuki, who's one of my like heroes when it comes to gaming, like the guy is one of the rock stars over at Sega. I don't think Sega. he's, I'm not sure if he's there anymore or not, but um, I mean, had such a huge impact on both of us growing up in the arcades because he was responsible for Virtual Fighter, for Daytona USA, for Outrun, Afterburner, Space Harrier. I mean, like you, basically any kind of huge Sega arcade coin op was under his direction mm. and Shinmu was his big passion project. And so somehow Adrian found out that he was coming to the Bay area for like a day. It wasn't even like a whole day. It was like half a day. Like he was, uh, if I had to guess, he was probably in town for business because Sega has a headquarters in San Francisco. And so he knew uh, how big of a fan I was. He let me know. I'm like, Oh my goodness. And so a group of us went down I think it was in San Jose 
It was either Santa Clara or San Jose, mm. somewhere in the South Bay. It's probably San, Santa Clara. I don't remember exactly, but oh my goodness, it was absolutely amazing. Um, gosh, you make me want to like bust out the. Uh, you make me want to bust out the the, the game, Steve. Mm. It's a it, that was such a special moment because, um, and then there was like this this really big line of of fans that were there, so we stood in line, and, and I brought my Shinmu game. Uh, for him to sign and uh, was able to buy a couple of shirts. And they, they, you know, they had some, some swag there and uh, yeah, man, I forgot I gave that to you. That was a long time ago, but it was the coolest thing because I got there and I shook his hand and, and um, he had a translator guy, um, you know, assistant that was there. And I just told him, I said, man, you have made such an impact on my childhood. Thank you so much. And, and he was very gracious. He was very humble. I mean, just a, a gentleman of, of a, of a, uh, contributor to the, the the gaming community. I mean, my goodness! Like the, this person, uh it was just, it was uh, absolutely amazing. I, I I'm I'm getting chills, Steve. I'm remembering what it was like, and I think at the time I was probably like 22, 23. I was I was a young strapping lad, yeah, filled with dreams and grandeur. So it was probably twenty years ago. Then it wasn't like it wasn't thirty years ago. Maybe I was twenty three. It was, it was my early twenties. My goodness. Well, thank you for wearing that, Steve. Yeah. Um, I thank you there for was, wearing that. <laughs> one time my wife was uh, looking for just like a shirt to wear to bed. Mm. And some of my, I mean, some of my shirts I've gotten in my car stereo days and I just like grabbed a shirt like they're X, 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 L. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like really big. And so she's like, do you have a shirt I could wear just to, to sleep in? And I was like, yeah, no, you can wear any of my shirts. Just any of them. You're good. Shirt, wear one shirt. of my shirts, baby. And so, um, and so she, I, I think I, at some point she grabbed this one. I'm like, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so my shirts, but that one. It's so funny how she gravitated towards Shin, the Shinmu shirt. The Shinmu shirt. Well, I think this one was actually close to the the bottom. I didn't want to pull it out of my 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 drawer. Yeah. To wear, I just wanted it to stay there, and it, it's pretty much gonna. I'm mean, I don't want to wear this really unless we have a show because I don't want to be like, oh, oops, I spilled coke on it, <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, I can't get that stain out, so. I, I, it's, it's towards the bottom of the of the drawer, but I think she was looking for one that was, you know, just mostly solid color, yeah, like this, so she can sleep in. Anyhow, thought I'd wear it for you. Oh, very, oh, thank you, Steve. I hope that you will wear it more often. But you have to be careful because, yeah, he did autograph that shirt, right? And it was really funny because I remember at the time. He asked me where where I would like, uh, yeah, I would like him to sign the shirt, and I didn't want him to like sign it over the art, so I was like, I'll just find like a blank spot. And again, big line of fans. He was only there for a certain amount of time, so I didn't want to be like, you know, high maintenance. Be like, oh uh, no, actually, could you go over? You know, just like, yeah, dude, it's fine. By the way, I got him to autograph my Shinmu game. So on the game manual and the game discs, I have Yu Suzuki's autograph on there. Freaking awesome! Wow. So, uh, birthday was really good. Yeah. Back to the reason why we're back talking. To the birthday. Back to the birthday boy. So, uh, wife made really good dinner. And I, and I thought, hey, I, you know, I'm staying home from work. I kind of had to stay home from work because <laughs> ice. And uh, so I, <laughs> like, I got to work in my, my sweats. Oh. I was working my skivvies for a little bit, but I thought, yeah, I, I just need to put on something a little more Bet appropriate. You were. <laughs> and so I put on the sweatpants. But uh, so it was a great day, and um, nobody was was complaining, and it was awesome. And so the day was good, meal was good, and I felt like the man. <laughs> so then yesterday <laughs> happened, and I get this strange text from AT&T and I go and my wife comes home. She actually went, she, she went into Dallas to work and crazy enough, didn't have any, you know, no sliding and whatever. <laughs> and uh, she comes home and she's like, Hey, I got you a new phone, a new phone, a new phone. Now I hadn't been asking for a phone because I'm a very, you know, I don't really do all that much. I take some pictures. I play some games I text. That's about all I do. Mm. But what happened was what set what set 
her over the edge. What was the tissue that broke the camel's back, Russ? Uh, I have a feeling I, I'm going to agree with his wife. Go ahead, Steve. I had taken a selfie earlier in the day of me eating a chocolate chip oatmeal cookie. Okay. That had she had made the day before. And so I put it in my mouth and I took a picture like ah, ah, like that with this big this big cookie in my mouth. Mm-hmm. And so then I, you know, as hot and sexy as that is. Um, oh, I, I, took, I, I, I believe it. It is. Yes. <laughs> I you, you, you take epic <laughs> pictures of you consuming different things that have to do with chocolates. And so I took a picture of myself and I sent it to her thinking that, hey, this is going to be funny. And she sent me back something with like the barf emoji. Like, what are you doing? Like she thought like the picture, I guess, wasn't nearly up to par. Like we were so past. 10 megapixels, 12, 12 megapixels, whatever way that my iPhone 7 had. We're so much past that. And she goes, I couldn't tell that it was oatmeal and chocolate chip in your mouth. And I thought you were like eating some kind of like cereal, like <laughs> raisin nut bran or something. And, and you were like showing me what you were chewing on. And so she was like, this is the cookie you made. I haven't even chewed it yet. And then and she, and that's, that's what set her off. And that's why she got me a new phone. I'm like, I don't need a new phone. And she says, well, I know you would never go out and get yourself another phone. And I know you're going to keep this for years. Mm-hmm. So she got me. Oh, the 12 pro, the 12 pro Ooh. Ah. in Pacific blue. Ooh. Now what you do realize that you need to, um, you need to get the phone case that has Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think it was from the Predator movie. I, I actually, uh, I wish I had known you had this because I would have queued this up oh, for us to look at. Oh, did you post that, that like months ago? <laughs> yeah. When this phone design first came out, you'll notice it has like the uh, the three circles on there for the camera. I think that and was it, for the 11 though, wasn't it? Oh, I don't, I can't. Well, honestly, I don't remember which one it was, but what was funny about that was how it perfectly matches the that, Gatling like, gun that he had. No, it was like a rocket launcher or something. Oh, but right. It was the funniest thing. I was like, man, if I ever got a, that version of the phone, I would totally get that. Like, that is such a rust thing to get. <laughs> and I would I would show that off proudly. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> you should totally do it. Uh, it's probably like 130 bucks just because like it's trademarked. <laughs> I don't know. Well, congratulations oh, on that. Man. What a swell gift. Way I know. to go, Steve's pretty, wife. Freaking awesome. And I don't even, you know, I'm not even used to a phone that big. Cause I just like, you know, I'm, I'm calling and I'm texting and I'll play like clash of clan. And that's right. it. I don't need a big phone. And so, and it's not the, it's not the big size. It's the small size, but now that's like an inch bigger in my pocket. I'm like, oh, make sure nothing's in the way. <laughs> move, move these keys and stuff out of the way. Make sure I'm not wearing skin tight pants. <laughs> I'll have to put the latex pants back in the closet. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I just held it, it, it felt so much smaller. I mean, I have an older, I have like, I think I have like the 10. You have the X. 10, you have the 10 S max is what you have. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it, I wouldn't want the phone any larger than this. And, and so I think that what you have there is perfectly fine. So that's a great gift. Fantastic. So yeah. what, what did she make for you for dinner? I remember you mentioned something amazing. So she, what she did is she, she bought like these ribeyes from Costco and cool. it was like 50 bucks for like three of them or four of them. Yeah. And so then what she, she found out this way to, to marinate them with like butter and garlic and thyme and rosemary Ooh, and stuff. Yeah. And so then she, she, she cooked the steak, how you're supposed to cook the steak. And then Wait, she, did she grill it or did she cook it over the stove? Over the stove. Oh, what nice. too cold to grill? Hey, no, no, no. I'm, I, I've done it myself on the stove. And, and then, so we, she has this pot where she melted all the goodness and then she'll, she took the steak and she would, she put it like side by side yeah. on this, the pot where, and where all like the, the goodies were. And so then she would take a spoon and she would like uh, grab some of the melted goodness and put it over the steak like, repeatedly, repeatedly. And apparently this is what you're supposed to do. And then, so she would do that with every side of the steak. Ah. So like it, 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 it kind of like fries the outside of the steak, but with all the goodness that you want in the marinade. Interesting. 
And so it was pretty good. And then she made scallop potatoes. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. And now, uh, of course, you know, we had some wine. And um, it was it was it was nuts. I was pretty. I gotta good. say, props to Sarah because she really, man, she she is an awesome cook. Like I, my wife and I still talk quite a bit about that time she made those lobster tails. Like seriously, that was probably the best lobster tail I've ever had in my life. I, it was so good. So I'm just putting that out there because you know my birthday. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I, I, I'm so oh my goodness. <laughs> my, my, my saliva has gone into overdrive thinking about all this tasty food. That's um that's like your Homer Simpson. Oh my birthday. My birthday's <laughs> coming up. <laughs> anyway, my my hope is to have some sort of surf and turf representation when it comes to that. I, I would because I'll gladly uh grill myself and everybody else some uh, some flame and yawns, and then if she's down. It'd be fantastic to have those lobster tails again. Oh, I think there's some left over. That's funny because I, I'm not a big seafood guy. And so I'm like, yeah, it tastes pretty good. It tastes good. Mm. But I mean, everyone else was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It, it was seriously good. What have you been playing, Steve? What have you been watching this week? Playing pretty much nothing except for Final Fantasy, Russ. Now, are you past kind of that odd middle part or are you still there? Yes. So basically, I have passed that part. I, I beat that beastly looking sewer dog. Yeah, That's yeah. right after that. And uh, I'm he looked making, pretty cool, didn't he? Oh, uh, he, he looked good. Um, and I, I, I thought, I think Twitch is against me because when I Twitch, <laughs> like I'm, I, I can't beat him. And then I turn Twitch off and then I beat him in an instant, like with no problem, oh, no problem. Interesting. Anyway, I thought you were going to say something about like how you were, you were having technical difficulties and like, no, I always find I'm, I'm in some sort of weird mortal battle with Twitch in the sense that like, if I'm not planning on having some sort of thing during like our typical Wednesday night streaming at 930 PM central time, it works like a dream. Yeah. The instant that we, that we're trying to get logged on and good to go. I mean, anything and everything just goes wrong. I'm just like, perhaps this is not the time for me to be able to stream. I'm not exactly sure why. So, anyhow, I turned it off and then I beat him no problem. And I've been making my way through the sewers. I'm basically making my way back to like sector seven. Okay. I think. Um, I'm meeting back up with Avalanche, essentially. Right. I, I, I know exactly where you are. They were going to like um, destruct this part of the underplate of Midgar, which was going to fall on the slums and like kill a bunch of people. Uh -huh. And so I'm, I basically have to alert folks and say that, you know, that's, this is going to happen and not, not our fault and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm made it out of the sewer and I'm nearly back to where I'm supposed to go. And I think I'm like level 25, I think. 24, 25. Uh, oh, know, I beat that big ghost. It was like in the train yard, the haunted yep, train yard. Yep. I did that part. Yeah, that wasn't too hard for me. I, I got yeah. through that pretty easily. Right. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're making your way th into more of the exciting parts of the game once more because yeah. th that did you did you end up like doing all of the side quest stuff? Like you find all the yeah. kids, you find all the cats. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did all that. I'm good for you, Steve. So otherwise, I finished season one of The Mandalorian. And what'd you think, Steve? The last episode was predictable. I will say that. I, I was like, nope, that guy is going to die. <laughs> and that alien is going to get it. Yeah, he's he's going to die. And <laughs> or better yet, that stormtrooper, he's going to die. <laughs> Call me crazy. Probably going to get a shot with a laser. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I'm like, yeah, no, he's going to die. He's going to live. Couldn't shoot the broadside of a barn. Yeah, they're going to have a gunfight. I mean, it's the Mandalorian. But see, here's <laughs> the they're deal. They're going to play a game like tic-tac-toe. You know, oh, it, okay, okay. it that's, was one of those situations the where the style of the show is, in fact, a spaghetti Western. Yeah. Like, everything is leading up to that big face-off, right? Like, you know it in your bones. You're like, hey, this is this is, this is is where we're going. Like, it, it's yeah. somehow, some way, it's going to be headed to some sort of massive, like, battle or shootout or something. It's the Mandalorian. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I... I loved one of the things I'm, I'm going to be a little sensitive because I'm not sure if it's, you know, I mean like it's season one, like we're, we're already done with season two. We're going into season oh, three, sure. but I want to be a little sensitive to folks who have not yeah. seen it. Um, I did like 
how the the battle, the end battle, we'll just call it that. I like how it was set up because it wasn't like some sort of huge Death Star type of battle, right? It didn't have to be some sort of a huge galactic thing that like Star Wars is known for. At the same time, though, it had its own like microcosm of epicness in terms of seeing this like battalion uh, show up and, and the, the, the main antagonist show up and that sort of thing. And just the, the composition, the framing, the way things worked, I really appreciated that because of how it was like this... Again, it's, it's kind of like if you, if you took a magnifying glass into the world of Star Wars and you look at that particular area, that was like a dangerous moment for that particular spot in the galaxy. Did you have that same kind of response? Like like when you, when you had that, it's like, yeah, you know, I don't need like a ton of X-wing fighters and TIE fighters right. and like some sort of huge thing in like in the space as a, as a big space opera. Like, like this was very fitting for, th- for the Mandalorian. Right. And I, I really appreciate all the, the extra, like, spaceships and, and space fighters and cruisers yeah. and stuff because all the Star Wars that we've been seeing in the last three, four years, they have, like, no design, like, whatsoever. For for which ones? Like, the la- the Star Wars that we've been seeing, like... Seven, eight, nine? Yeah. There has been some in there, but... Um, I- yeah, there's stuff in there like with rockets and they're kind of like floating around. Well, I mean, but I mean they, nothing they, like, oh, that looks cool. Well, I, I mean, I, I think there are certain ships and stuff that I think are are pretty cool looking in, in there. But I mean, I think I, I can say on, on my side of things, I prefer more of the classic look, right? Like episodes four, five, and six. In my opinion, you can't go wrong with the stormtrooper armor from episodes four, five, and six. It's, it, it just, it's such, it's such a handsome armor, Steve. And also the, the ship designs and whatnot. I mean, I've always been a big fan of like, even, even the ship designs from episodes one, two, and three, I thought were beautiful. Doug Chang did a wonderful job designing all that. Um, but I was really happy with the Mandalorian in the sense that because it takes place, I want to say season one takes place in between Oh, I'm a little hazy on this. I want to say it's between episodes three and four, or maybe it's, it's no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am mistaken. It is between episodes uh, six and seven, actually. So um, good for you, Steve. And just wait. Season two, it's like two, three times as good as the first yeah, one. I'm going to have to start that this week. It's, man, it is a lot of fun. I'm so excited that you were playing catch up on that because that means that we will be able to uh, actually watch season three together. Together. And I forgot to mention this last week, but I watched the little things, which not the big things, not the big things, not the medium sized things, not the medium sized things, not the halfway in between things, <laughs> but the little things. Which that's with uh, uh, Denzel Washington and Jared Leto. Good old Jared, yeah. Not bad. It's kind of a psychological thriller, although more psychological than thrilling, I would say. It's a little bit kind of a slower thriller. Yeah. I guess. But, you know, that was that was all right. I mean, it's always good to see Denzel on screen. Oh, I like yeah. Him. I like him a lot. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a good day when yeah. you can watch some Denzel. Yeah. Anything else, Steve? That's no, about it, Russ. Well, okay. So um, I didn't really do a whole lot this week because it was, has been a very productive and busy week. I've been working on uh, several things for the show and also uh, just my day job uh, over at 31st Union. Uh, things have uh, definitely gotten busy and stuff, and that's a very mm. exciting, very good thing. Yes. Uh, however, I was able to play, uh, some more cyberpunk, find some more time in there to um, continue enjoying that game. Uh, <laughs> what's really funny is that the, so I, I swap back and forth between PC and console, depending on, I don't know, just what I'm in the mood for. Well, there was one bug in particular on the console version though, where like I'm driving, uh, down the road uh, on one of the, the the highways, and suddenly my car starts to go through the the, the road. It's not staying on the road. I'm like, oh, okay, this is a bit interesting. Um, so yeah, there there, there are so <laughs> yeah, many it's good buttons. to launch on the console, no problem. They, you know, <laughs> hindsight, they should have just released on PC first and then delayed the console so they could get the stuff done. Uh, but anyway. Um, another thing that I was very excited about and I, and a shout out to Hernando Rozo, or as I like to call him Nando, he, uh, he texted me earlier this week with this little doohickey that came out on uh, social media, Steve. Okay. 
it's none other than a little teaser for Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the movie. Really, really cool. Oh, my gosh. Really, really nice. If you, if you noticed, the two had two tails at the, the end of it there. I did. I think I, I, I know. I, I thought I saw something else earlier that um, I knew like tails was going to be in it. Well, so at the end of the first film, they had like a little teaser because Jim Carrey was in, uh, you know, as Dr. Robot Nick, he, he was in more of that fantastical right. realm with the huge That's mushrooms and stuff. Of. And then um, Tails at the end was like searching for Sonic. And so you see like a little glimpse of him. So this, yeah. this is awesome. I mean, it's not like a huge surprise, but it just makes me giddy because um, being able to like see some sort of like official word on what's happening and everything else. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And hopefully the theaters will be open at that time. Cause I believe the date was 2022. Yeah. April 8th, 2022. It will be a, a, a fun time. Indeed. I'm a Sonic fan. Steve, you know this. I know you know I this. Know. I, know. I think you had a good time in that first film too. I, I did. I had a better time in the beginning when I saw a very beautiful rendered Green Hill Zone. Uh huh. Then I did later in the movie Gosh, when it was, was like good. mixing computer anime with like real, like just live stuff. I, I just, that stuff's always kind of wishy washy. If they would have just stuck with the, the CG. That that is, they would have had more of a winner. You know, I think that, that so it worked in terms of the first film of him being introduced and, it, and especially with Jim Carrey also get, kind of getting introduced to Sonic and then his character, Dr. Robot Nick, all of a sudden being in this fantasy world. My hope is, is that Sonic will spend the majority of the time in more of like his fantasy world or some other fantasy world more so than Earth because I feel like Maybe he ping pongs back and forth like briefly to say hi to his buddies or whatever. But I mean, really, like I want the world of Sonic to be realized in glorious, high definition, high poly count, ray traced. I mean, just like like you said, that that first part of, of the movie of Sonic 1 um, where he's going through like, like basically like the Hollywood version of Green Hill Zone. I was like, <gasps> like the 10 year old in me, I was, uh, I was loving it. The other thing that I did play was Control Ultimate. It was <laughs> the Control the Ultimate version that, yeah. that was been released for Xbox Series X. They have ray tracing that they have put into that version of the title, which is great. It's interesting to me how there is this trend going on with games where like you have these games that have already been released. They're great games. But they are a bit older, you know, like like uh, Control came out, I think, in 2019. And so it's nice that, that, that they're giving them these little facelifts and stuff. But I feel like it's kind of a stopgap me uh, measure in terms of like waiting for like games that are built from the ground up to take advantage of these systems themselves. Like we haven't had a game like that come out. If I had to guess, I think the new Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart or Rifts Apart. I think that's going to be kind of the first foray into that, at least for the PS5, which I'm looking forward to. I think the game looks really cool. I was going to say, or just rifting. <laughs> Very nice, Steve. Very nice. So our topic of the day is remembering Mike Nash. Um, this is a gentleman who has worked in the video game industry and the movie industry and is, I don't know, like, like a, a, the one of the ways I want to describe him is kind of one of the unsung heroes of the, kind of the, the art side the design side of the games that he worked on, the movies that he worked on. Um, unfortunately, I found out just the other day about how um, he has passed away. He passed away on January 18th of 2021. There's not a whole lot of information out there in terms of um, what was the cause of his death. Um, but I, I thought it, it would be appropriate to be able to just celebrate his contributions to the art world, the digital art world, as well as, as his contributions to gaming and movies. And I thought what was really nice was that I went to ArtStation because ArtStation is where he would uh, 
constantly be posting his, his latest works and whatnot. And they, they actually posted this page that is in memory of Mike Andrew Nash. And uh, they, they posted some of his works. And so as you can see, he did um, a lot of the, uh, the design work on Horizon Zero Dawn, which is one of my all-time favorite games. And I feel like, you know, with him being the lead principal designer on this, this game, um, I really want to take a moment to be able to just kind of reflect on that a bit because when I was playing this game, obviously it wasn't just one person who put together Horizon Zero Dawn, but he was was the driving force behind all the mechanized like dinosaurs and creatures that you see in the game. And it's amazing the sheer amount of detail that he placed into each one of these creatures. Um, and and it, it's it's so interesting to me how when you look at one of these creatures, like it just, it, everything fits together. Everything works. There, there is a flow to the design that in your mind, I think subconsciously just makes a lot of sense. Um, and he's, he continues that into other types of, of projects that he works on. But if you look at it, it's not haphazardly put together. It's not something that like has a lot of fantasy to it or anything like that. It's, it's very practical. It's very accessible. Like I could see someone actually wearing this stuff. Um, and it just, it just, it, it's amazing when you look at, at some of the, um, different samples that they posted up here, because you're, it's, it is, it's just gorgeous. It's, he is, he is on another level entirely. Uh, one of the things on this particular page too, is you have other folks who are, rock stars in the gaming industry as well as the film industry who are offering their condolences as well as, as um, some thoughts on, on what they um, had to say about Mike and um, just a really touching page. I, I, I really appreciate art station doing this, um, th this whole type of setup and you can, you can check it out. I think they're, they're going to have it up there for, for a while, but um, I think that, that Mike had a lot of, impact and influence as to, um, how to, to think about design in terms of, of, of these types of approaches. One of the things that I think is interesting too. Um, um, so I, I don't know Mike, I've never met Mike at all. Um, our buddy Sean worked with Mike, um, uh, on call of duty advanced warfare and he, he and I were hanging out one day and he was just talking about certain people who had big influences on him during his time, uh, over at infinity ward. And this was one of the folks who he brought up quite a bit and, and had nothing but, uh, positive things to say. He, he was just absolutely inspired by, um, the sheer talent that Mike just had constantly. And we were actually, um, we were working on, um, the possibility of having Mike come on joygasm. We were, we were actually in, in talks to like, see if we can try and coordinate something. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, um, the limit of, of which I knew, you know, I say in quotes, knew Mike, I didn't know him. I, I never talked to him personally or anything like that, but we were, we were actually coordinating an effort, uh, to have him come on the show, be able to do a, a profile on him. And so I'm very sad to, to, to hear the, the news and, and um, it's a reminder of how fleeting life can be. I mean, it, it's amazing. This, this gentleman is, uh, I think he was 36 years old and um, it, it's, it's a, just a, a tragedy that, um, that this, this type of thing happened. But I think it's important to be able to, to be able to, to remind all of ourselves about like how important it is to, you know, don't take life for granted to, to um, life is fragile. Yeah. Like be able to go out and pursue what it is that, that you're passionate about. Don't forget about the folks who you care about. I mean, like, like there are so many things that I think we all can get caught up in on a day by day basis. And then suddenly someone is, is out of our lives and it's like, wow, that's, Man, that, that, that's, that's such a, a, a shocking thing to have happen. In terms of, um, I want to keep going on on the, uh, the Horizon Zero Dawn part of it. Um, you know, it, playing the game, the, the game has so much going for it in terms of um, the art direction, the story, um, what, just 
the the atmosphere and the immersion of the world was one of the the best that that I've ever experienced. And a large part of that has to do with the design of these mechanized creatures. And um, I think that that it's kind of a, a two pronged approach, right? You have the design of them, and then you also have the animators that bring them to life. And, and having um, the crazy amount of talent that went into this, I mean, the the videos and then the gameplay experience speaks for, for themselves, honestly. But um, I loved being able to to look back on many of these different types of creatures that um, exist within the world. This is just one of them. Um, here, here's another example of um, one of the, the bird creatures that Mike had designed and put together. And I remember playing through this and, and every encounter was such a, an epic encounter. It was never like, like you got bored fighting these beasts you know, like every time you're like, whoa, okay, let, let's try and do this. And, and yeah, you, you would level up, you'd get more powerful and some of them became easier and that sort of thing. But there was this, I don't know, like, like there was something just like visually captiva captivating about each and every one of these different creatures. Like if I skip ahead here, let's see if we can find another one here. So they're, they're taking out the, the bird creature at that point in time. So uh, what did he do on Call of Duty? Call of Duty, um, if I remember correctly, he was responsible for a lot of the armor the, that the soldiers wore. Um, I don't know, um, you know, in great detail, all the different things that he contributed to on there. I imagine he probably also contributed to perhaps some of the, the vehicles that were in the game um, or perhaps even um, to... A smaller extent the environments but i want to say probably the character armor like with like i said just the different types of of, of uniforms and and um more of that techie type of stuff that is in the game um, i think he definitely had a hand in you have not played horizon zero dawn yet um and i look forward to when you do because uh it, it truly is a special game and and um the the sequel is coming out um, I think either this year or next year. I don't remember exactly what the date is and I'm definitely looking forward to that. I don't know if Mike had any kind of um, participation in the sequel or not, but um, regardless of whether he did, his imprint is on this game big time because of, of how he was able to um, put these creatures together. And again, like when you look at them, it's really amazing because there's, there's like this organic quality uh, mixed in with the cybernetics that I find to be really neat. Like, like it's almost like that. What's the name of that one place that actually does exist in the United States? It's like Boston, something or other. Like, like they, they've been making those robots. Yeah, I was looking in there. One of the people who said something about it's like uh, Boston Dynamics or something. I think that's it. Yeah, because one of the people who had uh, gave him condolences. Um, uh, Vitaly, Vitaly, uh, I forgot his last name. Vitaly? Um, I think so. Also worked with him at Boston Dynamics. I think it was. Okay. Because I looked him up because I'm like, I recognize that guy from somewhere. I've seen him in interviews. But anyhow, yeah, that's that's the place where if you've seen on the internet, like they, they're making these weird looking like, not exactly Terminator, but more so like Horizon Zero Dawn looking robots, like pack animal type, but robots. Right. And they're like pushing them with hockey sticks and everything, and they can't get the thing to, to fall over. Or if they can, it gets right back up and continues to do what it needs to do. Kind of scary looking stuff. But, you know, I'm, I don't want to sound insensitive or anything, and I'm, I'm not trying to, but a lot of folks on the development side, I, I've never heard of. And... I think, you know, folks who, who pass at a, at a young age, you know, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's crazy sad. Cause you always think you're like, I want to die old in my sleep. Sure. Like, you know, and, yeah. and that's how everybody expects to go. And so you think, okay, well, I mean, who, who was this person? Who, what did they do? And then you go, oh, okay, I recognize this, that, the other. But then you start to read about other people who knew that person and then what the works they do that were inspired by this individual. And you think, well, good, like, wow. I mean, I'm just an average Joe, yeah. you know, who, who plays the game. And I don't really look at the credits all that much. I mean, maybe if I start recognizing some names, I'm okay, cool. Um, but then you start to stem off from that. For other people who go, you know, I knew this guy and then I worked on Call of Duty. I, I knew this guy and I worked on, 
you know, maybe Mass Effect or or maybe I knew him and I worked on Half Life. I don't know. Anyway, this guy had inspired other folks and he did some tutorials and stuff yeah. online. And and so you just you never really know what kind of imprint you're gonna have on somebody. I mean, this guy probably expected also to, to pass in his sleep at you know age 102, but I mean, if, if you Google some of those names that were on that list that you were post up there, like oh, that they are, yeah, they they are the elite, right? Like like they these are people who uh, are on the bleeding edge of how to approach design. They're they are incorporating and introducing new ways of being able to um, approach how you how you model, how you design that sort of thing, and um, yeah, it's. These are the type of people who, I mean, they're constantly working on their craft. Like it's right. amazing how you have, you have such a a supreme level of dedication to trying to improve, being at the top of your game, and yeah, every one of the, the, these um, folks are, are extremely talented. And yeah, I mean, it's I think it's one of those things where. I think that's why I let off by saying, you know, it's kind of a, an unsung hero type of, of scenario just because um, you have these games, these amazing games that we will forever remember that, that we just, we, we constantly geek out about. We talk about um, how wonderful an experience it was, how there were some novel gameplay mechanics and like, and you have, you have rock stars in every capacity. You know, it's not limited to just design. You know, you you have rock star animators, you have rock star coders, you have rock star game designers, rock star producers. I mean, like you you just you just have these these people who work in this creative space in the entertainment industry. And it's it's a it's such a privilege to be able to to just be able to meet some of these folks and perhaps even work with them find out about their methodologies, perhaps even combine your, your, your creative forces, so to speak, all in the name of trying to make something as awesome as it can possibly be. And it's really kind of, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't, and I think Hollywood's like this too, right? We're like, you have certain types of technologies and special effects, but you don't really hear too much about the folks who are behind the curtain, pulling the levers and turning the dials, right? Like we are all completely blown away by the end result of whatever it was that they worked on. But it's always more of the cast, like the directors and the actors and whatnot, who kind of have their names out there that people recognize and know and, and fawn over. Um, and I, and it, it, it is a bit of a, a disconnect in terms of how that isn't carried over with this other side. Yeah. Did, did, um, did the article say how he passed? Cause I, when I read it, I didn't, I didn't see it. Was it COVID? No, you know, his, his family is deciding to, to not really disclose that information, which I understand. I, I get right. it. Like, like they're, they're grieving at this point in time. Um, and I think that um, the community is just being respectful in terms of not wanting to pry on that. And instead, you know, and I think this is a testament to um, his parents. Um, his, his parents are, um, I think have been pretty vocal in that too, um, in terms of like wanting to um, have his memory remain as someone who was um, just on that bleeding edge, who who was this extremely talented human being. There was this um, this interview that that took place um, that you can find on YouTube. Um, that there was a it was an interview with Mike's parents, um, and it was I think about an hour long, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Oh no, it was about 38 minutes. And, um, you know, for those of you who are watching the video, I'm, I'm playing an excerpt of it here. Um, I definitely encourage you to check it out. I think if I, I hope I'm pronouncing this guy's name correctly. Uh, Siamak R if you, it's S I A M A K. And then, uh, I think his last name starts with an R perhaps. Well, the, but, vid the video is called from Mike's parents to you. Yes. Yeah. That's probably a much easier way of finding it. Just type in from Mike's, uh, from, from Mike Nash's parents to you. And, uh, and if you're interested in seeing that you can, um, I watched it last night. Um, my heart definitely goes out to them. Um, definitely, um, want to send my condolences to them. I, I, it's gotta be absolutely devastating in terms of being parents that, that, I mean, you can tell that they, they are so proud of their son. They love their son to death. 
Um, and it's, it's gotta be heartbreaking to be a parent and having to, uh, deal with, with, uh, the loss of, of, of your, your child. Um, but it was a very sweet interview. It was neat to, to, to gain some, some insight with all of that. Going back to Mike's art station page, I also wanted to just show some of the projects he worked on. So we were talking about Horizon Zero Dawn. He was also involved with the movie Chappie, which I haven't seen I've yet. I've seen Chappie. You, you saw Chappie? Uh, it's a good movie. Chappie was recommended to me uh, for, to a friend of mine. I've, I When I was working not for Target, inside of Target, <laughs> got to make that clear, um, the, I, I would constantly see that that movie, you know, I was curious about it, but I just wasn't curious enough to watch it. And then one of my friends goes, you have to see Chappie, watch it. And then he gave me his uh, copy to, to borrow and, and watch. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a good movie. Hugh Jackman's in Chappie also. I need to way. see it. Um, it was it's, it's one of those films that has gotten away from me, but he was involved with, um, I believe it was the design of Chappie, the that character. That makes sense. I can see it making that. Yeah, it's kind of, it looks like his style. Oh, totally. Yeah. And then there's this, this other project that hasn't come out yet. Apparently, it's um, slated to come out in 2022, but it's called Warriors of the Future. Um, and apparently, um, he did suit design and modeling for props, robotic design, interior design pieces. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that. He also did some work for NVIDIA as well. Um, so, and you know, what's interesting. This is, this is on his, his, uh, about page here. And, um, he only has these three projects, but I know for a fact that he was involved in many other projects, um, which goes to show you, um, it, it's just amazing. Like, like where he was able to go. Uh, like, like for instance, I told you he worked on call of duty with infinity ward. Uh, he did. I know for a fact he worked, um, on uh, on the other Call of Duty titles with that Sledgehammer Games worked on, uh, we were actually talking about that a little bit at Thirty First Union because there are folks who I work with who worked with Mike, um, and they were very sad about the news as well, and they they were able to to talk about um, some of the contributions he made and that sort of thing. So uh, just just crazy to to, to see the. Um, the level of, of projects that he worked on. This is a, another um, screen that showcases his portfolio. And it, it is so neat to be able to go through some of this. I mean, like here's one where like a, he was playing around with more of like a, a Spider-Man type of uh, motif, but with his kind of design sense, which I thought was really cool. Um, what page is this just for the folks who are listening? Well, so this is this is his art station page. So um, if you go back, let me let me uh, return back. It's artstation.com slash Mike Nash. Really easy to find. Um, and there, there's a ton of uh, different examples in here. But I'm always struck by how realistic his work is. You know, it's not just limited to the textures, but I think in terms of the, the methodical layout of how everything fits together, I think is, is just a really neat case study. And it's almost over. It's, it's overwhelming in a, in a good way. You know, like your eyes are like, wow, look at all this stuff. And and, and it looks sophisticated, you know, it looks futuristic. It, it, It looks like it's been well thought out. Like you don't have pieces that don't belong there. And, uh, you know, the, going back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, when I was talking to Sean, he, one of the, the main things that he was pushing was that when he worked with folks like Mike, um, Mike was one of those people who really introduced the idea of being more aware of how you're designing something like don't just put something in there because it's the trendy thing to do. Like you have to think about it from a functional standpoint. How does it actually fit together? How does it work? Why would that piece exist in the first place when it comes to any given design? And I think that, um, that was something that, that I hadn't really thought about either, you know, cause like I think about like, for instance, gears of war, um, and how, you know, when, when you look at it, Gears of War has always been a looker of a game, right? Like they, it's always been uh, just this really 
uh, cinematic experience and and uh, the characters look larger than life, that sort of thing. But if you stop to look at, at the different pieces of the armor, um, they they tend to break down to a certain extent in terms of, of its functionality. Like it looks cool, but you're like, okay, how 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 does this actually fit? Like, why would they have these different things? And that was something that, that Sean um, brought to my attention as well. Um, and I think that that was uh, a really insightful point because now I find myself when I look at that, it's like, yeah, why, why would certain pieces exist on that? Is it just for some sort of visual flair or is it, is there some sort of method to the madness in terms of how this stuff all works out? Um, what do you think about uh, some of the works that he's done? Yeah, well, now I was going to mention that too because it, it seems like, okay, you know, if this was real, you know, I, well, I'll pause there. <laughs> Sometimes when you see like something animated on screen, you know, object, robot, superhero, something rather, um, could be like, you know, uh, a character from Final Fantasy VII, let's say, that, you know, that was for PS1 back in the day, right? And you're like, okay, well, how how does this piece of clothing actually work? <laughs> Just because at that point, the technology is so basic. It's like, okay, here's a figure. We're going to slap some colors so you know it's a shirt. And you know they're <laughs> pants, you know, but, <laughs> you know, how is this armor actually hanging on to their shoulders? Is it just like grafted on there to surgically sewn or what? Right. And so then um, you can kind of think of, okay, this is how this is where the ears would be, so that the, the 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 loops of a helmet or a mask would have to be have something for an ear, or else if you're wearing this twenty four seven, which you are in the game, you know it has to be functional. He has to be able to hear, or else these straps would basically cut his ear off from so much flexing, right? Right. Or if it's a belt, it has to have some sort of buckle, right? And it has to fit through some belt loops, or or even if a, a, a shoulder pad has to fit on with some sort of straps, right? And so um, as I'm looking through this gallery. It, it, it does look like that. You can see some of the armor stuff has like screws and bolts and stuff and, you know, and, and looks like certain parts weigh heavier than others to counterbalance other stuff that, that weighs more or weighs less, you know, or maybe off to the side. Um, and so it makes it, it does send kind of a more realistic image of, Hey, if this was, in today's you know, real life, not yeah. just a game, not just a fantasy. This is more or less how it would look and or function. Right. Uh, earlier you were, you were making a, or you put up the Spider-Man mm -hmm. mask that he had. I didn't, you know, people who aren't watching this won't know what you were referring to, but you can tell that certain parts of the mask were fabrics. Like it, they were kind of meshy because they had to stretch. Um, his jaw looked like it was reinforced because he's got to talk and people are probably going to be punching him in, in the face, most likely in the, in the jaw. Uh, Cause that's oftentimes where people get hit, like kind of right in this button area. Sure, you know, yeah, they're, not yeah. gonna, they're not going to try and punch him, you know, right hook on the temple. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they would, who knows, but <laughs> Spider-Man wouldn't let him. Well, well but I think the point that you're making though, is that he, he spent time thinking about, okay, what, which areas would make sense for hard surfaces versus, versus other areas that would be stretchy, like you said, or soft surfaces. Um, and, and having that, you know, just, just thinking about things like, you know, if you're Spider-Man, for instance, you don't want some sort of hulking, you don't want like Iron Man armor. You want, you want the flexibility because you, that is one of your abilities that you excel at. You want to be able to have that flexibility to be able to do those amazing acrobatics as you swing around in the sky. But at the same time, you don't want to be completely squishy. You want to have certain elements of armor on you so that it, you, you stay protected and so forth. This is a video um, that's been playing where this is Mike um, going through. It's a, it's a time lapse, but it, it just demonstrates some of his methodologies as, as to you know, when he's designing, when he's building out something. Um, I, I think it, it, these types of things are fascinating to see the creative process that someone like Mike goes through. Um, and so this is, this is in ZBrush and, and he's um, designing some kind of uh, mask for uh, a humanoid type of uh, and ZBrush is a what, Russell? It's a program, obviously, but for, for folks who don't know. Oh, for folks who don't know. Uh, okay, uh, yes, this is a ZBrush. <laughs> um. So ZBrush is um, the it's basically the premier sculpting platform. Uh, it's it's by Pixel Logic. It uh -huh. has been around for quite some time. Uh, I think it got its start right around two thousand four, two thousand five, and. 
it is absolutely a, a fantastic piece of software. This is something that everybody in the entertainment uses, or excuse me, everybody in the entertainment industry uses. And um, you're able to, to basically do all kinds of hard surface and, and, or, and organic style uh, sculpting with it and then be able to export it into your more classic 3D programs like Maya or 3D Studio Max, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, really, really cool. Um, I really should spend more time in this program. <laughs> nice. But anyway, um, did you have any concluding thoughts, Steve? No, Russ, I don't. I mean, um, it's always sad when someone goes early and young and someone's so inspiring. But um, yeah, I mean, what, what can you say? What, you, what, what, you know, what are you going to do? I definitely want to express our gratitude um, to the the parents of Mike uh, and and just give a heartfelt thank you to uh, Michael Andrew Nash for his contributions. Again, um, even as someone who just enjoyed the the fruits of his hard labor, uh, I just definitely want to give a heartfelt thank you uh, to him as well as to the the family. I also like to thank um, Art Station for 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 making it a point to to have someone like Mike not remain as an unsung hero, at least to, a, to their capacity. You know, I think it's a, it's a really great idea for them to do this sort of thing um, for future instances of folks who are a part of this community to at least be able to, to have some sort of memorial, but also not let them fade from memory because of the crazy amount of um, forward thinking that, that individuals such as Mike have put forth. Uh, I think, I think that they're really onto something when it comes to that. And my hope is, is that um, even these studios, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, with, with the new horizon game coming out, I think it would uh, be a, a really swell thing, honestly, like, like, like a highbrow type of thing. If, if they were to dedicate the sequel of horizon zero dawn um, forbidden West to Mike, just because without his contributions uh, from the first title, the the game would would have that hole in it, um, and I, I think that it is just uh, really important. So that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. We want to thank you for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out Patreon.com/slash/Joygasm, which is spelled J O Y. G-A-S-M, and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it helps us continue doing all of this. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. Last but not least, do a search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our video gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. When they work. Yeah, when it actually works. Central time. We'll see you next week.